Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Maston. I am the Coalition Manager for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. And I'd like to welcome you to today's SAMHSA-sponsored webinar titled, Meeting Youth Where They Are, Prevention Programming to, to Support Mental Health. Today's presentation will be recorded and the recording link, slides, and a certificate of attendance will be sent via email to everyone who attended today. Closed captioning is available and can be viewed by clicking the CC at the bottom of your screen or clicking the link in the chat pod to view in a separate window. We also have an ASL interpreter who should be spotlit on your screen. During the presentation, please add your questions and comments in the chat box and questions will be asked out loud for the presenters to answer at the end of the presentation. When the presentation ends today, a brief survey will show in your browser. Please take a few moments to complete that for us and let us know how you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you again for joining us. And I will now turn this over to Jackie Zimmerman from Mental Health America to introduce our speakers. And she will also give a brief overview of today's webinar. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome everyone. We are so thrilled to have you joining us here today. Like Kelly said, your mics are muted and your cameras are off, but we encourage you to use the chat today. We would love for you to head in there, give us a greeting, let us know where you're tuning in from today. I see some of those already coming through. Hi folks, it is so great to have you from all over. My name is Jackie Zimmerman. I'm the manager of public education partnerships and e-learning at MHA's national office. And I'm joined here today by Mental Health America of South Central Kansas and their prevention team to discuss how they're addressing youth mental health in Wichita, Kansas. They'll share their wide net low barrier mental health education programs that engage young people in social, social emotional learning, healthy coping skills, and substance use avoidance. We will have some time at the end of our session for questions. So please feel free to use the chat to post your questions, share any resources you might have or make comments. Chris, I'm gonna have you advance our slide. We want to thank SAMHSA for sponsoring today's webinar. We are so grateful for their support on this very important topic. We do want to note that the views um, and opinions expressed are those of our authors and speakers here today and aren't necessarily reflective of SAMHSA or HHS. We also want to remind folks talking prevention today that MHBG funds cannot be used for prevention services, but we're really excited to share some tips, tools, program um, ideas with you all today that hopefully you can take back into your own communities and find really beneficial. We have three incredible guests here from MHA of South Central Kansas. Chris Gilmore, who is the Director of Prevention at the Mental Health Association of South Central Kansas. He's been on the prevention team since 2018. Welcome, Chris. We also have Lauren Gilly, who is the Prevention Program Facilitator for Elementary Students in the Paths for Kids Program with Mental Health America of South Central Kansas. Welcome, Lauren. And lastly, we also have Pat Patricia Joseph, who is a dedicated advocate for youth well-being and mental health empowerment, working at MHA of South Central Kansas in their youth prevention. Welcome speakers. We are really excited to have you here sharing information with us today. Um, just one more reminder to everyone, post your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting those and have some time at the end. But without further ado, I will hand it over to Chris and your team. Hello everyone, my name is Patricia Joseph. Um, I am currently um, just moved on from MHA, but I'm still doing some programs to just boost up the prevention because we believe in it so much. So we're just trying to make the programs that we have more widespread within the community, and making sure that every child and every youth has access to the valuable information that we have. Hello, my name is Lauren Gilley. Um, I am currently a prevention facilitator at MHA. Like mentioned, um, I'm in the PAVS program, so working with kids um, 
in elementary schools, so grades five and under, as low as kindergarten. Um, I was previously a fifth grade teacher, so I have that school background. So um, I'm getting my master's right now in mental health um, counseling. So right now, this position is the best of both worlds, combining mental health and students, and it's awesome. So. And as Jackie mentioned, I'm Chris Gilmore. I'm the director of prevention. My uh, background is being a troubled youth. And so now I get to be involved with these kids, trying to provide them with education, opportunities, insight. Um, and I get to work with a great team of people who do a lot of things. We are in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, we'd like to share a little bit about what we do in prevention. Um, and so please ask questions in the chat if you have them, and hopefully you find something of value uh, during this time. Our objectives today are for you to receive insight into the programming and curriculum that you can use in your context, gain ideas for building a team, making connections, establishing what we call a wide net, low barrier prevention initiative to limit social or serious emotional disturbances, mental illness, um, destructive choices, and then learn practical advice from folks who spend their days in schools, in the community, uh, with students, investing in their lives. The idea is that if you wanted to, you could take some of these ideas and um, adapt them into your community and your context and build a prevention youth program from the ground up. So we'd like to tell you what we do, uh, what we see, what we experience in the schools and in the community um, and why it matters to us. So what we do, we'll start there and we'll start with what is prevention. Um, for us, um, prevention is any effort to support the emotional um, and mental behavioral health of a person, including but not limited to education, mentoring, modeling, and building connections. Anything we can do to support a child um, in our context in particular is prevention. Even if they uh, don't remember our name, even if we don't see them ever again, the idea is that we are making a connection with them, modeling something, giving them a skill set, a tool, uh, and building a network of support around them. For us, success is anytime a student learns a skill, feels supported, knows who to call, or makes a healthy choice. Um, we, we want anybody to be able to benefit from what we offer. And we measure success as, as few as one child uh, making a difference in their life. We mentioned it's a wide net. We will cast out and hope that we could catch one or two or maybe a couple hundred or maybe a thousand kids, um, giving them skills as they navigate uh, this crazy world that we live in, um, the challenges that they're facing as young people, the ever-changing access to technology um, and increasing challenges in the world. We will talk a little bit about some of the outcomes that we see here in a little bit, but we measure um, in some of our programs, we ask kids before we begin, we ask kids at the end of our time, do you feel in control of your life? Um, and we have seen a jump of about 40% um, of kids saying they do not feel in control of their life um, since COVID. And so these kids are struggling, they're hurting, life feels out of control, they're not sure what direction to go. Um, if you're in this webinar, you're probably fully aware that there's increasing anxiety and depression, uh, suicide actions and ideation, self-harm has gone through the roof. Um, in Wichita, we're seeing all kinds of issues around uh, youth violence. We have a 30% increase in youth being arrested for assault. Um, there's just a number of kids who are hurting in a number of ways, and it affects them at school, in their relationships, it affects their future. And so we consider all these things uh, a spider web, where when one area vibrates and tingles, it affects another area. And so if we can help a child feel supported in their mental health, if we can help them know what to do when they're dealing with anxiety, if we can help steer them from choosing unhealthy coping mechanisms, um, we consider that a success. So prevention for us is anything that we can do to support the emotional, mental, or behavioral health of a person. Or as I tell my middle schoolers, my job is to try and convince you not to do stupid things. 
Um, I don't know that that's a clinical term, but that's essentially where we're at. So how do we do that? We uh, go into schools and we provide our services at their school or at their site, um, anywhere um, that, that, that we can show up. So currently we serve elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. In the summer, we serve parks and rec centers. We've done boys and girls club, day camps. We've met with churches, counseling centers, foster homes, group homes. Um, we're providing service wherever there are youth, wherever we can help meet their needs, have conversations with them. Um, that's where we show up. So we consider it wide net, low barrier. I've mentioned that a number of times already, but that's a, a phrase that I like to use a lot because not everyone has access to services for mental health. Um, I think the current estimates that are about half of youth with treatable mental health disorders receive services. There are things like uh, financial issues, access to insurance, transportation issues um, that affect whether or not a child is going to be able to receive services. There's back end things like sometimes people don't notice what's going on. Our teachers are overwhelmed and overworked and they're trying to teach kids how to read. They're not always noticing or paying attention to some of the other concerns that might be popping up. And so we get to come in and we get to offer our services to absolutely every single person that the school will allow us to. Um, we consider it, um, if you've ever been to a neighborhood pool, that's zero entry, there's no lip, you just kind of can wade in. That's what our services are meant to be. They're completely free to any site that we serve. Um, they are accessible, they're student interactive. We want them to, to dictate what we teach. We want them to be met where they're at. Um, and we do this for eight to 12 weeks, most often one time a week showing up into their classroom, uh, lunch groups, after school clubs, and those kinds of things. Um, in Wichita, 79% of our public school students are experiencing poverty. And so it's important for us to offer services that are at no cost, that there's no barrier, there's no reason they couldn't participate. Um, we go to them. And now we'd like to share a little bit about some of the programming that we offer. So coming from a background of teaching elementary students, and like Chris was saying, if you've ever been in a school or you know a teacher, maybe you've been a teacher as well, teachers are there to teach. And we want to often be there to be the support that kids need emotionally, mentally, um, especially in today's day and age. But that's not always the reality. Um, a lot of times the focus is really heavy on the academics and that's just how it is. Um, so this position is really awesome. Paths is just amazing and it's really taken my breath away to see some of the results from this, which we'll talk about more later. Um, but our Paths for Kids program is um, K through fifth grade, as you can see on the screen. And then it has recently started in sixth grade through eighth grade. Um, and on the next slide, we'll talk about Pathways, which accompanies Paths um, for middle school. So in elementary school, we are just learning basic social emotional skills, um, things that we expect to be taught sometimes. And we really can't always expect that or anticipate that kids are knowing these things. Um, so social emotional learning, evidence-based curriculum. So we're not just um, teaching fluff. We're not just going in and saying, how do you feel today? Happy, sad, mad, you know, even um, one of the first lessons that I teach with paths is feelings. And kids are always like, yeah, I know what feelings are. Um, and, you know, they'll raise their hands and say, oh yeah, mad, sad, happy, excited. And then it slows down and it's like, anything else? And that's about the basics of their knowledge on feelings. Um, so going into depth with what kind of feelings we have, what those feelings mean, um, talking about some gender norms that we see, such as a lot of times it's okay for girls to be sad. It's not okay for girls to be angry. A lot of times it's okay for boys to be mad or angry, and it's not okay for them to be sad. Um, so talking about that and the kids really resonate with those things a lot of times. And I think sometimes you just see that little sparkle in their eye that they're feeling seen or heard um, for maybe the first time. And, you know, 
what we do isn't magic. We're just there to help them. Um, but it feels magical sometimes in those moments. So working with the teachers, working with the classroom, um, the teaching style is cumulative. So we'll start with feelings. We'll go into maybe coping skills, then anger management, and then friendship, how to work well with a team, um, those kinds of things. And they build on each other. So once they're learning a skill, that skill is reinforced moving forward and then continuing to build on it. Um, another thing with paths is we want to work with the teachers. So we want to make sure that if a classroom has a very specific need, for example, um, this semester, the class that I'm, one of the classes I'm working with has had a really hard time with bullying. Um, I, if you've been around fourth grade girls, they're scary. Um, <laughs> and I love them to death, but they can be scary because they can be so cruel to each other. Um, so a teacher said, hey, we're really struggling with bullying. So instead of going in and saying, oh, let's talk about feelings, this specific class, we're starting bullying next week, which usually is towards the end of the session for me, but that's the need in the classroom. Um, so adapting to what they need, what the teacher sees, because they're in there every day. They know their students. Um, and then things that students want to do as well. And like Chris said, making it engaging, making it fun. Um, you know, sometimes we do have to just sit there and talk at them for a little bit to get some information out, but taking breaks and really being mindful that they are children um, and that they may not want to be there all the time, but hopefully in their time, they get something out of it. Um, so yeah, we also do, which I think we'll talk about more later and I'll get into it, to it more later, but um, a pre-survey and a post-survey, and that's where we can get a lot of our data as well to see what kinds of things we might need to work on. Um, we can go to our next slide. So pathways is gonna be fifth through eighth grade. This, so paths is the social emotional building blocks. Um, pathways starts in middle school, um, teaching more about substance abuse. So it sounds scary to think of middle schoolers doing drugs or having access to drugs, but Again, if you've been in a middle school, it is a very real thing. Um, like Chris said, we're in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and yeah, I think it's just shocking to some people. Sometimes they're like, oh, my kid doesn't know what that is. My kid would never do that. Really? Students do this, this, this. You know, I would come home with these stories. And yeah, they do because that's what they're seeing sometimes in our community. Um, so with Pathways, just being there to really inform them, not just drugs are bad, but what can they do to your life? Um, and how can they affect you? Not just short-term, but long-term. And how can one time be the last time? Um, so these are also kind of like paths. Usually it's a group being taught um, in a classroom. Most times they can be lunch groups as well. Um, lessons, again, more towards their success and more aimed at substance abuse and making good choices. Um, so like goal setting, making decisions, being respectful. Um, so some of the themes that come from paths, but a little bit more grown up. Um, smoking and vaping and alcohol are discussions in middle school. Um, drugs, having resilience and being able to show resilience and stand up for yourself. Um, using hope, happy, Happy, happy's good too. Healthy coping skills, um, setting boundaries and communicating. Um, another thing with boundaries that I personally teach in paths is we'll talk about, you know, hugs and high fives. And um, a lot of times kids aren't really aware that like Chris was saying, they're in control of some things and that they should be in control of their bodies. Um, so in elementary school, we don't go as deep, but I will briefly talk with them about their autonomy for themselves and how to treat others. Um, because a lot of times I think even as adults, a hug is a hug. It's not that big of a deal, but just teaching body language and like, okay, if someone's leaning away from you like this, or if you're clinging onto my leg and I'm shaking you off, what does that mean? What signal does that send to the other person? Um, so yeah, hugs are great. I love hugs and I explain that, but I feel like it's just a basis for kids to know that they have a choice. And just because 
someone wants to give you a hug, you don't have to give them a hug if you want your space and your privacy. And yeah, that's my little, that was my mini uh, TED talk here. Okay. Alrighty, so we'll get into some of our other programs that touch from the middle school to high school level. Um, I love, Lauren, how you mentioned that we have to realize that it's not just about academics, right? Just like we need to look at the whole. So if we look at the emotional side, we can see that a lot of our students start to do better in school because they're not just focusing on academics, but also them as a person um, and the things that they struggle with. So similar to Lauren, I had some background in education. Um, I wanted it to go towards public policy and education policy. Um, I was doing AmeriCorps in New Jersey, and then I quickly found out that these students were not thriving because they didn't have access to adults who were just willing to listen to them. So we started seeing a lot of difference when we started focusing more on the social emotional side and started pushing that aspect. So one of the awesome groups that we have, um, two of them are Girl Empowerment and Boys and Men that creates this circle where um, these youth can come into a safe space and just be heard and listened to. Um, so they both address gender specific needs. Um, we want to empower the girls to become all that they can while um, uh, let's see, combating some of the societal standards that we've imposed on them. Um, and then for the males that we want to create a nurturing and positive masculinity space for them. Um, it is evidence-based curriculum. It's called the One Circle Foundation um, that we use. But another aspect of meeting the students where they are is sometimes that lesson's gonna be plan B. So if we come into the space and they just need to vent about what their week has been like, that's gonna be plan A is to just meet them where they are and then we'll get to the lesson. But we found that doing that is gonna be more impactful than forcing a lesson down their throats and then them walking away feeling that we never actually um, put actions to our words. Um, so that's something that I really try to strive for is to make the lesson plan B and wherever the students need at that time will be plan A. It is small group based. So the awesome thing is um, we can have these groups multiple times. Um, so we can make the groups a little smaller and then allow for another session to come after that. Um, we really wanna empower students to make the choices that respect themselves and others. So we talk about, okay, who do you wanna be as a person? But also, um, who do you wanna to be to others? So um, the golden rule, treating others how you wanna be treated, but also how do you manage conflict when it does happen? Um, how do you have those conversations that are tough? Um, so we really try to work on that. Um, and then for their lessons, we wanna identify emotions, right? Because just because you're in middle school and high school does not mean that you have um, all your emotions down. I'm still learning, hey, I feel this way, you know, as things happen in life and you're uh, faced with different things, you experience different emotions. So um, we still work on identifying. Um, Self-esteem is a big one, um, especially in our girl groups. Um, influence, violence, healthy coping skills, leaving a legacy, which is cool. Like, who do you want to be when you leave the school? Um, when you move on and they bring your name up, what, what are they going to say about you? Um, social pressures. Um, we're living 2024. Social media, there are so many social pressures. Um, so that makes for very dynamic conversations where um, we talk about, hey, this is the person I want to be, and this is what everyone's doing. Around. This is what social media says I should be doing. So how do I step into who I want to become um, without sacrificing who I want to be. Oh, that's a really good one. And then friendships. How do you manage friendships? Another one that is you will always learn how to develop positive and healthy friendships. So we are deciphering, um, are these your friends? Okay. Look at your friends and look about who you want to be. Does it correlate? And if it doesn't, that's another conversation. Uh, the awesome thing is as you build these groups and you begin to really meet the students where they are, they become like a family to you. Um, and that's really cool to see. So they begin to open up and you have to really set that precedence of this is a safe space. Whatever's in this group does not leave this group. And that really opens the door to awesome, awesome, awesome conversation that you can have with the students. Um, we can move on to the next one. 
So this group um, connects, I'll touch on first, this is my baby. Um, this was the leadership group that we started whenever I came on to the team. Um, it was really just, let's empower some students, right? Let's empower them to become leaders in their school, in the community, and hopefully that they can take the skills that we learn in our group and foster them into their um, school community and then out into a wider community. Um, so we did a peer modeling um, kind of structure. So we want the students to learn from each other. And then we also wanted to bring in other individuals to peer mentor them. Um, so that was something really cool to see. And hopefully they can foster some leadership skills. Um, we did lots of cool and fun activities to foster those skills. Um, that at the end of the activity was like, so what did you learn about being a leader? And they'd be like, Oh, well, I learned this and I learned that. And while they were doing that, they didn't realize that they were um, touching on some awesome skills like resilience and empathy and things like that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, our curriculum um, was staff and student developed. So we, when we launched it, we were kind of going day by day, seeing what the students needed. And we started developing the curriculum in that form. We had our, um, our core values, which was resilience, empathy, um, communication and integrity. Um, and whenever we started, oh, not communication, community, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, and we would do different activities that would touch on those four core values. So we began to develop um, what a curriculum would look like um, so we can replicate it in the, in the future. So club model was really cool. Um, we got to do it during lunch, but we also got to do it after school. Um, we got to get out to the community, which um, touches on our Y link, which is the youth leaders in Kansas. So that is essentially what Connects looks like, um, empowering that um, leadership um, aspect in the students, but taking it out into community so they could do it after school and spend more time out of the school setting for that. Um, our students were nominated, but I gave some pretty clear parameters that we didn't want just the A plus students. We wanted students that probably just needed a nudge in the right direction, right? Maybe they gave some troubles in class, but they could see the potential that the student had. So we wanted those students as well, so we can help them discover what these teachers were seeing. So whenever we did um, announce that to the students that they were nominated, it gave them, I would say, just an extra pep in their step. Um, it was like really an honor for them to be nominated and seen as a leader. And they would give me these real puzzled looks because I don't think they believed it themselves until someone had told them that. So that was an awesome thing to see the progression of not really seeing themselves as a leader to becoming a leader. Um, so a portion of the time is spent on student-led campaigns. So we've had a few. We had um, a stop suicide campaign that we did at one of the high schools um, because they were getting flagged for some um, concerning emails that students were sending that were alluding to self-harm. So we had that campaign. And then in our middle school, we had an anti-bullying campaign where the students made posters and hung them up around the school um, and tried to advocate for um, bullying in their school. Um, yeah. And some of the lessons included mental health stigma, leadership, um, readiness, mindfulness, resiliency, and a bunch of other skills. They taught me a lot during that time as well. Um, so with Connects and Y Link, it's just a really awesome opportunity to empower our students to make their voices heard and advocate for themselves and other students. So we can move on. Okay, so we have some stats for you because, you know, stakeholders and people love stats. So we had to make sure that we added this for you. So in 2022, we served about 184 Wichita students. 86% um, of participants were able to identify three healthy coping skills. So like the Warren mentioned, we have a survey that we um, gave the students um, just so we can kind of track their progress throughout the program. So that's another cool indicator. You ask them, hey, what do you do whenever you're feeling sad? And they list a um, multitude of coping skills. It's like, now let's break that down to positive coping skills. And then there's fewer ones that they can add on to that. So. That's an awesome skill that they were able to learn. 84% of participants were not, were not reported as chronically absent while participating in program. Um, and that's something that the administration even flagged as 
people aren't showing up to class. Um, if you create a safe space for them, they'll show up to that space. That's something that we've seen. 87% of participants had no suspensions or expulsions while in the program. 96% of participants had no new arrests while in the program. 73% of participants report an improvement in their social support systems, which we wanted to create this space as a social support in itself. Um, so that's kind of a correlating statistic. And 91% of participants report no tobacco, alcohol, or illegal substance use during the program participation. So love the stats, um, and hopefully we just see these numbers continue to grow. Boys to Men is our other, uh, what we call lunch groups. These groups, our facilitators go into the schools and eat lunch with the students in the classroom, in the library, sometimes in the hallway, uh, because there's not space for them in the building. Um, and these groups are geared toward the boys uh, to, and tackle all the gender stereotypes that go with that. Um, 2022, this last year we have our full statistics. This is my project for the summer to update these. But 96% of students reported no substance use during the program. 99% reported no arrests during the program. 84% said boys to men helped me build relationships with friends and or family. And now I have a strong support system. 78% of students say boys to men helped me recognize and manage my emotions. So I feel like these programs are making a positive difference in the lives of these kids. Um, as Patricia mentioned, lunch groups can be a handful of kids. You can do it multiple times. Um, we have more requests for groups than we actually have ability to do them, which to me shows the schools valuing um, these programs. With Boys to Men in particular, um, we've seen a number of kids who have shared things like, I had no friends and now I feel like I'm not alone. Um, we've had kids with disabilities who felt very self-conscious about themselves and um, singled out and isolated who were able to come to group and feel like they belonged for the first time. Um, we're able to use uh, groups like this to be uh, affirming of students. We've had students um, who are trans male um, saying, hey, can I come to this group? My family doesn't support me, but this is who I am. And we get to make space for them in those places. So the outcomes are measurable, but they're also internal and personal for a lot of kids uh, who come through the doors with us. All right, so for Connects, uh, Connects in 2022, we had 114 Wichita students serve. 84% of the students reported, I feel like I can make a difference in my school and community. That was an awesome stat for me to um, see and to ask that question because um, when students came in, they didn't think they were leaders. So in the beginning, that, that pre-survey, widely it was no, that they didn't feel like they could. So to see the growth in them um, is really special. And three percent of students reported, I know the qualities a good leader has. So going back to our core values and what makes a good leader. Also, do you have any leaders in your life or people that you look up to? If not, then that's going to be harder to um, operationalize. Like what is a good leader? I've not seen it in my life. So another um, job for us as facilitators was, okay, we got to show up as good leaders. If I say I'm going to be here on a Wednesday, I'm going to be here on a Wednesday um, and just showing them the, um, the aspects that we're asking them to hopefully develop one day. 84% of students reported, I feel like I have good relationships with other students. Um, so really just fostering a community within our group where um, it's about personal growth and making a difference in the community and in their school. Um, but yeah, those were our our statistics for Connects group, our leadership group. So with paths, um, since it is in a classroom, oftentimes we have a lot higher numbers that we're able to serve. Um, looking at the 417 students served in 2022, that is much higher, I believe, Chris, in 2023 and 2024, um, and probably will continue to be as we add people to our team. Um, I'll kind of go through these stats and then I have a couple things I can add, just things that I've seen outcomes in the classrooms. 96% um, maintain or improve attendance. You know, a lot of times the kids, if they do miss a lesson, they're like, oh, 
I missed you last week. I wasn't here. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> you know, so it's nice when they are looking forward to a lesson. 99% um, of participants didn't have any suspensions or expulsions during the program. 92% maintained or improved um, submitting their class assignments on time. 88% showed an improvement in social problem solving and empathetic behaviors. Um, empathy is something that can be taught, but I also believe it is something that we're partially born with. Um, and building empathy is hard. So especially when you're teaching to kids who, you know, developmentally until they're, I don't remember what the age is. I won't pretend that I remember, but at a certain age, you know, they do begin to develop empathy or they don't. Um, and really being able to see the perspective of their classmates or their teachers um, can really make a big difference too. You know, when they get in trouble for something, a lot of times we hear kids say, well, I didn't do anything. It wasn't my fault. Sometimes maybe that's the truth, but a lot of times they're not taking a look at how that affects the person on the other end of things. Um, so that problem solving and empathy are really a huge part of what we strive for in paths to build those building blocks to get to the programs that Patricia and Chris are in. 91% um, of participants showed an improvement in emotional self-control behaviors. These numbers I know are just numbers, but when you really look at them and think about what percentage of students are improving their behavior by simply having a safe space, like Patricia mentioned, having people who are there for them, even if it's one time a week, um, you know, and in a classroom, there's one of me, there's a teacher, um, but their job really is to relax for a little bit and just hang out while we're there. So there's one of me and there's 20 or so kids. Um, I honestly, first, when I came into this position, I was like, there's no way this can make that big of a difference just one time a week, but it does. Um, and the data shows that it does. So I just think that that's awesome. Um, some little extras that I have for you on this one. At the end of our program, we take a survey, which I had mentioned earlier, pre-survey and then a post-survey. And to the end of my post-survey last semester, I added a couple of questions. And one of them was, what do you remember the most from paths. And a lot of times those ones would just be boosting my ego. Like my teacher was awesome. And I'm like, thank you. I know. Um, and then the games are like the fun things. But then the second question I asked was, do you feel like paths helped you with anything? And if so, what? So very open-ended. Um, there is a question on there about, you know, did you learn self-control? Did you, um, those types of things, but I wanted to leave this one open-ended for a purpose. Um, I told them they did not have to answer this question if they didn't want to, but almost every single student had a response and had something they learned. Um, I only did this for fifth grade, but the responses, the number one response was it helped me show self-control. The second most popular response was it showed me how to be kind to others or some type of response about kindness. Um, the third was being able to calm down when I'm really angry or feel like I'm in a tough situation. Um, and the fourth was, again, being kind. So in different ways. Um, another thing that I saw, though, and this is, well, I can save that one for later. We'll save that one for later. But um, yeah, it can be hard and boring sometimes to just look at the numbers and be like, okay, cool, this, that. But we really are seeing the differences and kids are um, seeing those differences in themselves, too, like looking at some of these things from kids themselves. It helped me how to learn to love myself, helps me to calm down when I'm mad, paths taught me self-control. Um, I know how to be a better person now. Um, it made me want to be nicer and more kind to people. Finally being able to calm down and learning different ways to calm down. I felt comfortable. So things like that really just speak to like hearing that finally, like finally learn to calm down. And in fifth grade and you're just now learning like healthy ways to calm down. I just think that that's awesome. Even if it's just a couple of students, but it was a lot who said that, so. Our Pathways program is our substance use avoidance program. It was our only program that continued to run um, during COVID because we were able to meet remotely 
uh, when students were online and before schools were inviting guests back in. Uh, most often with the Pathways program, we go in and we take over their science class for a day. And so on Wednesdays, instead of science, you have Pathways with Chris. Um, and so we go in there and we run through the curriculum, we do all these things, and we, again, have found um, measured statistics that show that it's making a difference. Um, these surveys are, we ask the students, we also ask the teachers um, what they're experiencing. 98% of participants reported not being chronically absent. This was mentioned earlier, this is a huge problem we have right now in Wichita. A number of students are struggling with chronic absenteeism. 98% had, had no suspensions or expulsions while in the program. To us, this is a huge part of prevention. The students who are suspended or expelled are three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year than students who aren't suspended or expelled. 99.8% had no new arrests while in the program. 87% report a sense of feeling of personal control over their life and their choices, which is a 20% increase from where they were on the pre-test. We ask them where they were when we start, we ask them where they are when we, when we finish, and we have a 20% increase, just giving these kids a sense of control, some skills, how do I handle things? What do I do when I'm stressed? How do I communicate better? 99% are able to list three reasons why their lives are better without alcohol, tobacco or other drugs, and 98% of youth report no substance use during the program. So again, as these kids are faced with the pressures of the world, um, these are middle school students who are struggling with who they are, how to fit in. I don't know if you remember middle school. I try to block it out of my mind because it was not fun. Um, it's challenging, and these kids are going through hard things. And so when we have a program like this, we get to come in and be a voice of consistency, give them a safe space to ask questions and pathways we say regularly, like I'm not here to get you in trouble. I'm not a cop. I'm not a teacher. I'm here to give you an opportunity to ask questions, tell stories, gain insight so that you can make healthier choices and that you can be in control of the direction of your life. We think this helps with their academic programming. Um, their choices outside of school, their relationships has a huge impact on their mental health. And again, all of these things are connected together, um, particularly in the juvenile justice system. Um, there's a number of stories I could tell you of kids from Pathways. If you ever want to feel cool, um, go to a middle school and bring candy with you and they will flock to you and make you think that you, if you weren't popular, you will be for one moment in your life. Um, the great thing with this is we get to serve them as sixth graders. We then serve them again as eighth graders. So I get to see these kids multiple times and build relationships, see them in the community, the gas station, um, with their families, and we just build a bigger network of support for them. Um, again, some of the statistics are boring and it's just numbers, but then there's personal stories. There's kids who were, to, were able to share stories of how substance abuse has destroyed their family and they're telling that amongst their peers and it, kids are crying and opening up and sharing and it's just a beautiful experience. We get to talk about bullying and all sorts of ways that kids are, are bullied and trying to make respect a better classroom. We talked about boundaries. How do we set boundaries? How do we advocate for ourselves? What do I do if someone's making me feel unsafe? Because that's not good for me. And after a class, uh, the last time I taught the boundaries lesson, a girl came up to me and she said, what do I do if I'm not safe at home? Um, and we were able to get her out of an unsafe situation, um, which is preventing abuse, but also preventing who knows what kind of harm um, for her life in the future. And so we, again, measure success as one person, one thing, but we also have these statistics that show that kids are improving in a whole host of areas. Um, I wanna tell, talk a little bit about how we staff, how we do this. Our program is, outside of the school district or Mental Health America. So we contact schools and we say, or schools, community sites, Parks and Rec, Boys and Girls Club, and we ask, can we come in and host these groups in a classroom setting with some students at lunch? Can we start a club? And then we send our staff in to do that. The vast majority of our staff are either undergrad students who are studying things like psychology and sociology or graduate students or practicum students, people who are 
planning and wanting to work in mental health field um, as a career. And so we get to utilize people who are hungry and eager to learn and also who will work part time because they're in class. Um, we find a lot more um, flexibility when we can offer part time. We are not able to pay great. All our funding is um, grant or private funded. Um, and so we're kind of limited, but we offer flexibility and we say, hey, if you can work two days a week, I will put you in touch with the school where you can go and eat lunch with a bunch of high schoolers and pour into their lives, help them feel seen, give them some skills. And so our staffing is, um, is our, our team is great. We have fantastic people. Um, we uh, don't require anything beyond or anything more than two years of post high school education. Um, sometimes we've had folks who've stayed for a little bit. And then there's folks like me who've come and we've, we're just stuck here forever because this we feel like is something that we uh, have a have a calling towards. Um, we bring in all types of people. There are folks who we have had or do have on our team that are completely different than me or different than Lauren, different than Patricia, because there are kids just like anybody that you might hire. So we have one guy and he knows I feel this way about him. So I'm, I'm not judging him, but he is our big nerd. He's a video gamer. He loves to read fantasy books. Well, there are kids in our schools who love to play video games and read fantasy books. And he's able to be a voice in their lives and, and reach kids that I might not reach or that Patricia might not reach. And so it's there's, there's a spot for anybody who can do it. We've used interns before where people are volunteering or getting school credit and we don't have to pay them. Um, three things we look for. Um, we want people who are in this to make an impact. This is not just a job. This is something that matters. And so we want people that this makes an impact, that, that believe in this. Uh, a testimony to that is we have two staff who were in these groups as students. And they, Patricia is one of them, um, grew up to then want to invest in students the same way they were invested in. Um, so in it to make an impact, they have relational strength. They can build connections with schools, with the students, um, and then they're adaptable because we're walking into situations where walk, every school is different. You could have a group with sixth graders who is, needs one thing and a group of seventh graders who needs another thing. And so just adaptability, what are the needs of the kids? This is not about me imparting my wisdom. I think Patricia said it, the lesson is plan B. Plan A is what do these students need from me at this time? Um, our funding is all through grants or privates, uh, pr private, private uh, funding when we've, we've raised funds for it. We get grants from a variety of different sources, United Way, Kiwanis Club, um, United Healthcare. There is uh, in Sedgwick County, our county here in Wichita, there's a liquor tax um, and that money is earmarked to go towards substance use avoidance programs. So we ask them and they fund part of our substance use prevention initiative. Um, funding is always changing and shifting, uh, but there's a number of funding sources out there uh, if you look in the right places. As we wrap up, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to share some practical ideas and tips from the field. Yeah, so um, one thing that I've noticed is really important. Um, again, I do have the background of a teacher, but even if you don't, the biggest strength that you can have coming into a program like this and going into a classroom which can be intimidating is just being yourself and being genuine because kids will sniff it out. If you're being fake or you're not practicing what you preach or you're pretending to act like you like them and you guys don't really like them, <laughs> you know, and we have our favorites, but we love them all. And we're there for all of them. We're there for the kids who need us. Um, and they can tell when you're not being yourself or you're not being genuine. They just, they know, and they're not going to respect you. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to give you their time because why would we give someone their time if we don't respect them and they don't respect us? Um, so Jen, honestly, the number one tip that I would give anyone going into this type of thing is just being genuine and also understanding that they are kids. Um, kids who we probably don't know a lot about sometimes, you know, we're not their classroom teacher. We don't know what their home lives are like, but instead of coming at it from an angle of their kids, I'm the adult, they should do what I say. 
it's respect, like, duh. Instead of thinking it that way, we should think of it more like, okay, I'm going to assume this kid has something going on in their life right now, because most of the time that's probably true. Um, a lot of the schools that we work in are title one schools. That's not an uncommon thing. Um, schools with high needs, high behavior needs. Um, and just being able to see the difference when you show a child that you care about them and you mean it, they will listen to you, whether it's in their own way or, um, you know, sometimes I'll have teachers and they're like, all right, sit down, sit up straight, hold your hands, like eyes on the teacher, um, <laughs> which I understand. And that is respectful and they're being, trying to be respectful to me. So I appreciate that. Um, but another thing that I've started to utilize is little fidget toys. Um, it cost me $15 to buy like a hundred little fidget toys that I bring from class to class with me. They're quiet. They're not distracting. Um, but they have something that they can play with or fidget with while they are listening to me. Um, and that's kind of a way around, sorry, teachers in here, but the teachers who don't want them to do anything but sit there and listen, because a lot of kids, I cannot sit there and listen. So I'm not going to expect something out of them that I wouldn't do myself or couldn't do myself. Um, so just thinking about that too. Um, with meeting kids where they are, a big part of this again is talking to teachers and finding out what their specific classroom needs. So another thing I noticed, so elementary school is a lot different. Um, the younger grades, most of the time, almost always third, second, first in kindergarten, um, they'll usually respond to the survey. Do you like to come to school? Yes, 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 yes. Um, have you ever been bullied? No, 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 no. You know, and then it gets into fourth grade and fifth grade. Do you like to come to school? No. Do you, um, feel like you've been bullied before? Yes. Are you a bully? And then that's where we'll see people start, students start responding with, yes, they think that they are a bully. Um, so sorry, I'm going to backpedal here a little bit. One thing that we implemented this semester was a teacher and I were talking about how on the survey, um, I had noticed last semester classes that I was were teaching in fourth and fifth grade, students were saying, there's a question on our post-test that asks, do you like yourself? Again, kindergarten through third grade, almost always, yes, 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 not a single no most of the time. Fourth grade and fifth grade, um, so this is a huge number if you really can feel the weight of it, um, kind of makes me emotional, actually didn't think that it would saying it, but 25% of fifth graders reported that they do not like themselves. Um, a lot of this was girls, but there were a lot of boys too. And so we decided, you know, the curriculum is great and the curriculum serves its purpose most of the time, but this was one of the areas where we needed to adapt. Um, so we just added in a lesson about self-love. How can we love ourselves? And, you know, showing them a couple videos, but also talking about what does that look like? Um, and a lot of them didn't even know where to start. So we did this activity where they were making these, you know, hang with me, it's elementary school, okay? We are gonna do some crafts. They cut out these little hearts um, and put it in a little cup and they were making self-love cups. So they had to write things that they loved about themselves on these hearts after we had our discussion. And um, a lot of them had a really hard time coming up with one or two things even. And I asked for six to eight. Um, so they would start asking, well, I don't know. What do I have? Like, what do you love about me? I'm like, no, this isn't about what other people love about you. I could tell you what I love about you all day. And I always do, but you need to also find your value within yourself. Um, so moving forward, I think that will be a bigger emphasis as well, because it's just, yeah, 25% of fifth graders, do you like yourself? Not even do you love yourself? Do you like yourself? And it was no. Um, and I know we've touched on social media a little bit, but it just, it can be great. Technology is awesome for the reason that we're all here with each other right now, but the things that are being fed to our kids is just, it can be so toxic to their developing brains and not knowing what's real, what's not real and talking about that too. And, you know, sometimes people really do look like they look online. 
Sometimes those guys really are just jacked and muscular. Sometimes those girls really are just that thin and they just look that good in that bikini. But guess what? We're all different. We all have things that we should love about ourselves. We're unique. Um, and that's part of who we are and that's fun. Um, and, you know, sharing my own stories of insecurities I've had in the past and how I can overcome that too. Um, so I guess that would be another tip is just being transparent. They want to see you as a person, like Chris was saying, we're not there to be an officer. We're not there to be a teacher. We are here to be a presence for the student who feels like they have someone they can always be honest with and talk to and who's going to tell them the truth. Um, not saying that their teachers don't do that, but our role is just very unique in that way. Um, teachers have also seemed to really enjoy paths. They say these lessons were great for my students. Um, they learned a lot from this. This is a lot more useful than fill in the blank, the curriculum that they sometimes are given um, by their district, which is great that they have a social emotional learning curriculum in the first place. So I am not bashing that. Um, but yeah, it's just use the things that feel right. Your intuition a lot of times with kids is going to lead you in the right way too. So, um, okay, back to meeting kids where they are. Understand to be flexible. Your lessons are going to change. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go 90% of the time. And that's okay. Uh, don't assume that students already know specific terminology or feelings. A lot of times they don't, or at least half of them don't. Maybe some of them do, but keeping them on the same page. So we're all understanding the same thing. Working with teachers, which I've talked about, um, expecting big emotions to come up. We'll get back to that one in a second. And then the pre and post surveys can really be valuable, which I talked about already as well. Um, so the big emotions thing, like Chris was saying, a girl came up to him and said, well, I'm not safe at home. And then it's our job and the teacher's job. And, you know, we're going to make sure that student is safe. Um, so when I teach bullying, a boy came up to me just my last semester and he was like, well, what if, you know, with bullying, we're very realistic. People kill themselves because of bullying. Um, fifth graders, you can be that honest with them. They see all these things on their phone and they act so shocked when you say that. But we do talk about suicide a little bit, very briefly. Um, but as a part of our bullying lesson, the long-term effects could be suicide. Um, so a student came up to me after one of those lessons and said, well, what if we do think about that? And I said, what if we do think about what are you thinking about killing yourself? And he said, yeah, I've started thinking about it um, more and more. And I try to ignore it. Um, so, you know, I asked him, have you told anybody? And he hadn't told anybody. He was scared to tell his parents. He was scared to tell anyone because he thought that they wouldn't believe him. Um, so obviously, hopefully, needless to say, we um, worked with the student and we got him the resources he needs. He's OK. Um, but these things come up and big emotions can come up. And so we need to be ready to handle those things too and be equipped to know what resources to reach out to because it can get really serious really fast. So, sorry, I feel like I talked forever there, but. You're good, Lauren, thank you. Um, we, we are towards the end of our time here. We wanna open it up for questions here in a moment. And so if you have put some in chat, we'd be glad to answer them. Um, there's a number of more things we could talk about. So we'll also put up our contact information. If anybody has um, specific things you want to ask us personally, we'd be glad to. I'm realizing I got nervous and didn't say half the things I wanted to say and probably said too much of other things. But at this time, we'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Jackie, I'll take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Chris and Lauren and Patricia. That was so wonderful, really helpful. Um, you said all the right things, Chris. So um, give yourself some credit there. Thank you all for your amazing questions and comments and resources you've shared in the chat. We have quite a few questions here that have come through that we can start with. Um, the first question I want to dive into is a few different questions similar to this have been asked about how you made connections with schools in your areas, letting them know that these resources were available through MHA South Central Kansas, 
And what did you have to do to get the school and community leadership on board for these programs? Yeah, that's a great question and probably the, the most pertinent one. Um, we did a lot of meetings, calling schools, emailing schools, getting a hold of people and saying, hey, we offer these programs, they are free of charge, can we come in? Um, in Kansas, um, we have one school social worker for every 1,360 students. So they, are, they know they are completely overwhelmed and they're usually pretty hungry for it. So when we say, hey, we have free services, can we come? I talk about it all the time. I pick up my kids from school and the crossing guard is the social worker. And I'm like, hey, by the way, I have these programs. We can, and we got in our school because I talked to my own local elementary school. And so a lot of it is conversations one-on-one, -on -one, emailing and, and harassing people through email. Can we please come? Um, I've gone to the district when they have principal training day, I set up a table and I talk with school principals. And so it's just mm -hmm. throwing yourself out there and, and trying to let them know that these services are available. And then it's word of mouth after that. Hey, we offer these services or a teacher will say, hey, I did this with my students and then they move schools and now we're in a new school. Or I'm currently serving a seventh grade class because she was overwhelmed and she was venting to a teacher friend and they were like, hey, we have this program, get a hold of Chris. And so it just starts to build that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so many families and teachers and schools and administrations are recognizing that they need support and our schools are understaffed and a lot of times underfunded and under-resourced. So to have someone like you come in and say, we'll do this, I'm sure is a big relief for them. Um, one question I have seen a few come through about working with um, the teachers and the different schools, um, what do your relationships look like with the teachers whose classes you serve? How have they received this programming and curriculum and what does that dynamic look like? I'll so, let Lauren talk about that. Yeah, I was like, I thought. Perfect. Um, so I've only been with MHA for a, coming up on a year. Chris has been there much longer. So he has a rapport with teachers that he's been in their classrooms for several years. Um, in my experience with teachers, the ones who do have us in there are genuine or uh, tend to be very excited to have us there. You know, it kind of gives them a little bit of time to just sit back and relax and watch their class learn instead of being up front and center. Um, they're comfortable for the most part reaching out if they have something that they'd like to add or if there's something that they have noticed. Um, so the relationship between us and the teachers is genuinely, or uh, I don't know why, generally, there we go, generally really good. Um, and we email and back and forth. So if they ever have questions or concerns, we're always in contact. Um, they have Chris's information too, in case they need to voice a concern they might not feel comfortable saying to one of us, so. Absolutely, and I think um, teachers have taken on so many roles and responsibilities um, that they have yeah. so much on their plates that it can be nice to have someone else come in that is more of the, the expert like you are in this area to be able to provide this for their students and they see how that helps them engage in the academic side of things when their mental health needs are thought of and taken care of too. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's a wonderful resource to a lot of the teachers and they're very appreciative of you coming in and helping with that. Mm -hmm. Um, another question here, um, a few of these had come through, are the paths and pathways programs a curriculum you've built yourself? Um, are they evidence-based or available for the public to use as well? They are evidence-based curriculums. They're, they have way more stats than we do if you are a stat nerd such as myself. Um, and we purchase them and we actually will have a resource page with links to all of them, to all the curriculum we use. Um, the only curriculums we've developed ourselves fully are the, the leadership ones. Um, but yes, Paths, Pathways, Boys to Men, Girl Empowerment, we use purchase curriculum and then just adapt it to fit within each specific context. 
Thank you. I think that'll be really helpful. We'll be sure to include that for everyone. I know some folks had made comments about they have some type of programming at their school, but it's not quite addressing the current needs or they don't have any of these resources at all yet. So knowing that that's available and um, doing some searching for funding to be able to purchase and get these into schools is really important. Um, another set of questions that have been coming through are about um, who else you're engaging. Do you engage at all with the adults caring for these students, parents, guardians, etc.? And if you do, have you seen success in those areas? Um, yes, and some of it depends on the program. Um, when we do lunch groups, our our reach is way more limited because students are generally choosing to go and. We try to send home paperwork like, hey, we're doing this thing, and we don't know if the students bring that home. Um, but when we're, in, when we're in a classroom setting, we often send emails out to parents and say, or guardian, grown-ups is the language we use, um, we're, we're offering these progr this program for the next 12 weeks. We're going to be talking about these things, and we offer an, a newsletter. So you can opt into an email newsletter, and this week we talked about resilience. Here's a couple things to talk about while you're in the car around the dinner table. Here's a video um, to help you understand what middle schoolers are going through these days. And then we, at the end of our Pathways program, uh, we send a survey out to the adults as well. Uh, have you noticed any changes in your student? Have you had any conversations around these things? Because we think it's important that it's not just me coming in or someone else coming in, that these conversations are continuing to happen. Um, and we want to build strong, healthy relationships in the home, with the school, um, and as peers. So yes, we have, um, we could always use some more, but when we generally get really great feedback from parents saying, yeah, my child came home and we had a really good conversation about whatever the topic was that day. So, Yeah, that can be so helpful is having the parents on board too, to communicate the same message that you are. And some parents are extremely involved and able to be in that sense. Um, and we know sometimes students don't have that kind of support at home. So for you to be able to be role models and really um, step up in that way is, is very admirable. I know too, we had one comment in the chat that I loved that said, it speaks to the impact of your programs that students come back to be facilitators. And I completely agree. It shows that the connections being made in these settings are so important and are really impactful. And I think that's where it comes in. And when we look at ACEs and those positive childhood experiences that balance the ACEs out, having a trusted adult, having someone that cares about you and is there for you and that you can talk to is really important. Um, and so to be able to communicate with parents so that you're on the same page and then being able to be there for students who might not have that support, I think is something that you all are doing really well. Thank you. Um, a few questions about how students are selected for the programs. Um, one person had asked, I'm guessing they had to opt in, were they referred by school staff or parents? Any information you can share about recruiting students for the different programs? Um, each one is slightly different. So with Connects and Patricia, she told the schools, we want you to nominate students. And they got a letter, you've been nominated, and we're looking for students. So she said, need a little nudge. We're not looking for, you know, like I was the perfect student. We weren't looking for those kids. Um, we're looking for those on the edge. Um, with our other lunch groups, like Boys to Men and Girl Empowerment, we often ask the school, Do, can you identify some at-risk kids who are on the bubble who need some extra resources. Um, at one school, I had a group that the school was like, these kids are being bullied relentlessly and they need a safe place. And so that was what we did that semester. And then the very next hour where the kid, these kids are bullies. They need some different skill sets. So the school then chose them. Some schools, they have like um, signups, like, hey, we're gonna have, a boys to men club or, oh, we're gonna do girl empowerment and kids can opt in. The biggest recruiting tool for us is friendship. Um, hey, would you bring a friend with you? And that brings way more buy-in. Um, so some schools nominate, some schools don't let kids know it's optional. They're like, hey, you've been chosen, go to this group. And then 
like for pathways, it's in the classroom. So everybody is opted in. We do give them permission to opt out. Like when we send parent information, if you don't want your kid having these conversations, we'll come up with another plan for them. Um, so they go that way. But for the most part, it's either it's in your classroom or the school has identified you as needing a little extra assistance. And I'll chime in on that one as well. Um, we also don't turn students away. So if a student's like, hey, can I go with you today? We'll let them come on in. Um, I think it got to the point where we just didn't have room in the classroom. Yeah. So we had to start like doing a sign up list in week A and week B. But for the most part, the students will talk to each other about the group and then more students will want to come. So everyone's welcome. And that's incredible, you know, that you have more wanting to come than maybe you're able to serve in one chunk of time, especially in that middle school age when sometimes like doing extra groups and things just doesn't feel cool and doesn't feel fun. And so that you've been able to create an environment where kids see other kids doing it and want to be a part of that is really special um, and speaks to the programming and your facilitation. I think so much of this, like Lauren kind of talked about, is how to build that trust, how to build relationship. And when you're able to connect with kids, um, it really makes that impact for them to want to be there, to want to listen um, and to feel supported. So that's definitely a kudos to you all that you have such interest from, from the students. Um, another question I have here, and Chris, I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head. If you don't, we can always send it and follow up. But how many schools are you currently serving? Um, and do you have any plans to expand into more schools? I think we are at this exact moment serving um, 10 schools. They're not the same 10 schools we served in the fall. So because we go for eight to 12 weeks, we do a group. So we have a middle school here called Mayberry and every fall I do all their sixth grade science classes. And in the spring we do Mayberry eighth grade. Um, and so, yeah, we have more requests for groups than we have staff hours available because again, it had, word is spreading through the district. Um, we've expanded to other districts around us um, more this year than ever before. Private schools are reaching out. Hey, can we get in on this? Um, Patricia is our ambassador out telling people all that we do and, and getting us more connected. So um, it's generally around nine or 10 a semester. In the summer, it's parks and rec buildings and we'll go to every summer camp that Wichita Parks and Rec offers. We do summer school. Um, and then yes, we plan to expand. We just hired three new staff. We got some expanded funding. And so um, we're excited to get to offer. Um, we've made, coming out of COVID, we've made it a huge push. We need more people in schools, having these conversations with kids um, and we'll do as many as, as they'll allow us. That's fantastic. Um, I saw another question come in through the chat. I know you had briefly touched on this in your um, presentation, Chris, but I just wanted to uplift it again. Um, thank you for this question, Sam. Sam had asked, given the gendered groups, how do you navigate working with non-binary or trans youth who might be struggling, especially with gender possibly being a reason that they're bullied? Yeah, so we uh, squash it if it's showing up. Um, we, I had a student, I was doing boys to men groups and the student came up and they said, I would like to come to boys groups. I think I'm a boy and my family doesn't believe me or like that, can I come? And I said, if you are comfortable coming, I will be your advocate. I've got your back. And we just had a conversation the very first day saying, this is this student. This is their preferred name. They're here and we're going to be OK with that. Right. And they, everybody, everybody's like, yep, like we are good with it. And so I don't know if that helped set some culture for the school or if they already were in a healthier place at that time. Um, but that student was that was what they needed. They needed a place where they could be their full self and not feel judged. Um, and so we have run into things like even just the forms that we used to use just only offered male or female and we need to make space for non-binary. And then we have cultural struggles with all sorts of issues and what should schools do? And I have parents that get worried that we're indoctrinating or what. 
we've, we've tried to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And so we've adjusted forms to add non-binary and or other, or we even say, I prefer not to answer. Um, in gendered groups, it's where do you feel most comfortable? And if we've, we've even done groups where we're using the curriculum, but not using the name. And so we just call it like lunch groups and it doesn't need to be boys to men. That's just a, that's a name that predates me. I actually hate the name. That's a music group. Um, so, so we want it, we don't ever want it to be exclusionary. And so there's been times where we've operated as connects is the name, but we're doing girl empowerment stuff within that. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's great. And also just, I think it's really important when you're able to bring individuals into into your example of the boys to men group when you had um, a, a trans student come and they're welcomed into the group. And I think the more that kids can see humanity and see each other and build personal connections, um, the more they're going to care about each other. And we'll see some of that that bullying start to disappear. Um, your space is providing kids the ability to see um, others with different experiences and different perspectives and come together and and build relationships um, and so I think it's a really important space especially for those that might be struggling um, in a lot of different ways and we know our LGBTQ plus youth um, and trans youth populations see a lot of bullying, a lot of um, increased mental health conditions appearing at younger ages due to, to bullying and maybe not being accepted by their family or their community and having these real feelings of shame or embarrassment. So being able to come into a group like yours and be fully welcome to be themselves is so important. So thank you for that. Yeah. And that, just follow like we try yeah. to make that a teaching point. Like Yes. If a kid makes a comment, we correct the comment. If, if we're giving examples, we try to give examples from different perspectives, different backgrounds. Everybody is welcome. Seeing your humanity. This is a this is a practice for what you're going to go do in the real world. And so, like, let's be intentional. And I and I do feel like it is making a difference in in some of those kids. Yeah, absolutely. And um, they are in that stage where they're learning, um, they're experiencing things for the first time too. And so when you're able to really model those behaviors and how we respect other people, how we talk to other people and um, how we invite them in, that's um, really important. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left. I've got a couple questions left for you all too. Um, we've had some questions about um, and this might be specific to your community, not sure what the demand is here or what your specific population you're serving looks like, but a few questions about if you um, have a higher Spanish speaking population, if you've done any programming in Spanish, or if that's something that you would be interested in doing in the future. Uh, yes, um, we do have a large Spanish speaking population in Wichita. Wichita is a sadly very segregated city. Um, we have, in, I go to a school on Tuesdays and it's probably 95% um, Latino and that's just, the, we're very segregated. Um, and so we have, all our forms are available in English and Spanish and we have had, we don't currently have um, uh, Spanish, well, we have some who, who are not native Spanish speakers, but we had native Spanish speaking staff who were able to offer groups in Spanish or at least be able to communicate because sometimes kids are like uh, what I'm not sure what exactly how to say this and they were able to provide some um, wor words in the native language so um, yes I don't remember exactly what the question was I'm yeah. sorry yeah <laughs> yeah that's great just wondering if you've done programming in Spanish and kind of yes. what your population yeah. you serve looks like um, that's really helpful and can be really important and really nuanced when we're talking about um, mental health and like Lauren was talking about with feelings and the ways that we're communicating that to kids and for those who English isn't their first language um, it can be kind of challenging to keep up when we're talking about different mental health terms and social emotional learning terms and maybe things that get lost in translation so for you to be able to provide that for youth and for families with forms and things like that that's great um, let me see what else do we have on that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, you mentioned your surveying and um, 
the survey results you had were incredible to see of youth in the program and their responses of how well they're doing while they're in the program. Have you done any surveying on longer term effects of these programs um, or what youth behavior looks like after they've kind of graduated out? We have not. That's one of our uh, someday goals is to, especially we, we're seeing kids now as sixth graders and eighth graders. Have you, are you further along the journey? Have you regressed? Um, those kinds of things. So right now, um, no, but that is a, that's a long-term goal of ours is to track students over a number of years. My dream, if we get the funding, is to have a prevention pipeline where from kindergarten through 12th grade, you're involved in some form or capacity in our services. We didn't even talk about here, we have one-on-one -on -one lunch buddy programs with men. So our dream is you always have these things available. Can we track your progress? Can we see what you're learning and discovering? Um, but we are, right now it's a lot more scattered than that. Yeah, yeah. I know that is is always something that is is great to see those long term outcomes and surveying can be a challenge, but it's great to know that you're you're looking and thinking about expanding in the future. Um, I saw Amber in the chat had said I may have missed this earlier, but is parent consent required for these groups? Yes, Chris had um, let everyone know that for the classroom groups, there is an opt out form that is sent to all students. So. Um, their families are able to see that and if they want to opt out of the program they can and they'll have other activities for the students to engage in um anything else i missed there chris on on parent consent no and each school is slightly different on that mm -hmm. um, kansas passed a law a couple of years ago that we can't survey students without we can't give a non-academic survey without parental consent so we're sending home hey, we're, this is what we're doing. We'd love to survey your kids. Yeah. Um, some schools are way more lax and some schools are, you know, we're going to opt in. We also work with um, other organizations in the community that, that if a child's in those services, they're already opted in kind of a thing, like Boys and Girls Club um, or summer school, like we're part of the curriculum for summer school. So it's just like you're already happy. But we do, we do allow people to opt their students out. Um, or give consent. Wonderful. I have one more question before we wrap up at the end of our hour. Um, and then feel free anyone to jump in on here based on your experience working in the groups. Um, a few different questions and just comments coming through throughout today's session about the impacts of technology on youth and their mental health, and especially in middle school when youth are starting to have more individual access maybe to a phone or technology and how that can be um, impacting their mental health and the way they communicate. Have your programs addressed that at all? Are you having discussions about technology use um, or how to have healthy technology use, especially in, in the middle school area? Yes, um, I do a whole lesson um, in the Pathways curriculum. Um, and when I've done Boys to Men on social media and boundaries, um, I tell them all that if they lived with me, if I say, if I was your grown up, you would not have social media. Um, and we talk the statistics about the increasing anxiety and depression, particularly amongst uh, young girls in social media. We talk about, you know, catfishing and scammers. And um, we have a school here where someone shared photos they shouldn't have shared and then the whole school got them. And so we talk like, what does that do to a person? And what do you feel? And how do we keep ourselves from, you know, succumbing to, to awful things like that? And so we do a lot on social media because these kids are connected. Um, we do, we talk about like the voices that you listen to that you let influence your life. Um, yeah. Because I said, just because it's all out there doesn't mean it's true or good or, or worthwhile. Patricia just unmuted. So I know she's got some wisdom to add to. Yeah, no, all oh, that was awesome, Chris. Um, and the high school was really fun because we could get really creative with what we were doing uh, and had this awesome group of young people who I was serving. But we, we framed social media and said, okay, you guys are on social media. 
what can we do to be, make positive impact? So they started making their TikToks and their Instagram um, stories, just trying to speak life and empowering other people. So, you know, every on their feed, they just see negativity. And now here's an ounce of positivity um, whenever you come to my page. So that was something really cool to see when they recognize, okay, this is something detrimental to us. How can we now in our daily lives just do something positive? So that was a really cool thing to see. Yeah, I love that. Um, it is unfortunately and fortunately in different ways, something that's not going away. Um, and for youth, it's an important part of their lives and how they stay connected. But we do know that there are ways that it can be a real danger and a real harm to their mental health. So I love that, Patricia, that recognizing they're, they're on it and they're using it of how can we make this more positive? Um, and to Chris's point, how do we direct them to be safe and understand um, what safe behaviors look like? Um, so that's really great that your program's touching on that. I know that has been a real focus lately. Um, and a lot of parents, we've heard questions from of how do I navigate this with my youth and how do I talk to them about this? So the fact they're able to have some of those conversations with them is really great. Um, I know we're close to the end of our time here. So I just want to say um, thank you so much to your team um, at MHA South Central Kansas and Patricia for coming and joining us today and being able to share this really great information. I know I told you not to worry about looking in the chat, but if you were to look in the chat, you would see all of the comments from everyone inspired by your work um, and thanking you for the work that you're doing. And it seems like we've all been able to take a lot of really great information from you this past hour and a half. So again, thank you. You, Chris um, and your team and thank you to everyone who has been here joining us. We really appreciate all of your questions you've asked, all of your comments, your shared resources and um, your time you've spent with us here. I will turn it over to Kelly just for some closing remarks and reminders. Sorry, something had popped up on my screen. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, Patricia, and Lauren for speaking today and presenting and for sharing so much information with the group today. Um, as Jackie mentioned, there was a lot of communication in the chat uh, just about what you spoke about. And um, I was just wondering if we have a few questions that we weren't able to answer, could we send those to you and possibly you answer those and send them back to us and we can post them online? Would that be okay? Absolutely. We'd be glad to answer any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd like to take uh, take this time to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you and for sponsoring today's presentation. And thank you all again for joining us. Uh, please uh, fill out the survey at the end of the presentation as you log out and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.